Hey guys, how's it going? It's Chris here. This video is intended to teach you the basics of the Vengeance trading card game known as Vengeance Battle Card. Now, we're going to go over the field real quick. This is your zone, and that's your opponent's zone. You have the entire field on one board right here, and they're mirrored on each side. You have your main deck zone, environment, instant zone, defender, fighter, counter zones, support zones, discard zone, active uh, sorry action cooldown zones and then the exchange chain zone sounds complicated it's it looks like a lot it's really easy to understand let's get a mock duel going and i'll show you how it works now first you're going to choose which deck you want to use there is a wide variety of characters to choose from with each with their own some uh each with their own unique play style now for this duel we're going to choose alice on one side and mag crow on the other because they are both relatively straightforward and easy to understand whereas some other characters have specific quirks now each deck will have a main deck and an extra deck or a side deck whatever you want to call it now your main deck will consist of no less than 45 playable cards and no more than 60. your extra or side deck i i can i i choose to call it your side deck will have um, anywhere between 4 and 10, maybe 12 cards. It all depends on how you structure your deck. A minimum card you have is your fighter, which is not a card that you draw. You don't draw any cards from your extra deck. They are meant for very specific purposes. And we will get into the nuance of that in just a moment. Now, the main deck can have any number of exchange, counters, um, support. Now, action and counter cards may have duplicates, but only up to two copies of each unique card. For example, you can only have two copies of Erratic Expulsion. Support, instant, and tiered cards are limited to one unique copy each. Now, your side deck will always contain your fighter card. It will contain three environments right here, and it will contain the any tiered card that is two or three and it could contain your fighter's ascended card, okay? Now, what I would recommend to have a, a game that's the easiest to keep track of is to potentially pick up uh, small whiteboards or a large piece of notepad paper or some kind of a, an app on your phone that would help you more easily keep track of stat changes. I also would recommend getting a variety of uh, D20 variable dice to keep track of stat changes active on the board. I'd recommend having a fair number of these because there can be a, a lot of things on the board to keep track of at once. And I would also rec recommend getting uh, clear plastic uh, counter discs so you can keep track of other information. Now in order to have a balanced game, you are allowed to pit fighters against each other with vast differences of li the life stat against one another. Uh, but for the sake of balance and having a relatively fair game between each other, you you and your opponent are encouraged to choose a fighter whose life is within a two to five hundred point difference of each other. Now, in order for the game to start, each each player chooses their deck. You separate your main deck from your side deck. You put your you shuffle, put your main deck in the main deck zone, place your fighter in the fighter zone and set your extra deck aside wherever is convenient for you because you will not be drawing from that. Now once each player has their field set up, I recommend taking your, your notepad, your whiteboard, or your app and filling out the proper information for your character as seen on the card. Their stats right down here as well as their life and their CP. So you would have your character name, who you're playing as, you have your combat power, your CP, which is located in the top right. You have your life, which is also located in the top right, which is the triple digit number. Then you have your strength, defense, power, stamina, and mind stats all kept track of in whatever way is uh, easily configurable for you. And then you write down those stats as they pertain to your character. And then as a uh, increase or decrease, just do the calculations to keep track of where your character is at in power. Now, if you want to get into the nuance uh, of the differences of every single card type, I will not be going over that here because it's just a lot to explain without having to painfully show the examples. And it's very easily understood when you have the cards in your hand and you have the official rule sheet that you get printed with each copy that you order. And you can also download it from the website vengeancebooks.com. Once you have your field set up and, and you have your whiteboard set up or whatever you're using to keep track of stat information, before any cards are drawn for the main deck, you decide who goes first and whatever means works for you. The second turn player decides which environment will be active for both players from their side deck. So there can only be one environment active at a time in the, in the chosen player's environment zone. So let's say, for example, 
Mad Crow's team turn. Uh, now, for example, let's say that player two is going first, so they get to conduct their turn first, but since I'm going second, from my side deck, I'm choosing which of my environment cards is going in the environment zone. This effect is active for both players and does what the description says. So for example, I'm going to choose Dissonant Bout. Now Dissonant Bout has an effect. During each player's turn, they may discard one card to inflict 35 damage to their opponent. So you can set that right there. And now that that is active for both players during their turn, they are allowed to discard a card in order to inflict damage to their opponent. And once you had this, once you had the turn, the first turn, the second turn, and the environment is on the board, both players will draw six cards as their opening hand. Now the turn phase sequence is as follows. Draw phase, main phase, engagement phase, standby phase, and end phase. The draw phase is where a player draws one card from their deck to add to their hand, and any effect that activates during this phase will activate only after that card has been added to the turn player's hand. If the draw is negated, card effects will still apply after the card would have been drawn. Uh, then you have the main phase. This is where a player can interact with the field by setting cards, by setting cards in the field, activating card effects, and also activating instant effects. The other player can rebuke with their own effects during their opponent's main phase if their conditions are met. So let's go ahead and do a quick mock draw. We have our hand one, two, three, four, five, six, and let's say uh, our opponent went, and now it's back to our turn. And this is our turn hand. We draw, and this is our hand to start. Now, every single card type is color-coordinated and is displayed by what the symbol is on the card. So, for example, counter cards are red. You have the card name, then you have what type the card is, which is counter, and then what type of counter it is. There are three types. There is an evade, there's a standard, and then there's a block, okay? Each one of those has a specific meaning, which uh, will be unfolded as you interact on the field and like I said all the rules for all the engagement types are easily understood and they are in the rule book and you only really need one or two games before you can fully understand how those things interact. So in our opening hand we have three counters, we have two instants, we have an artifact or a support card, and then we have an action card. So what I want to do is in the counter zone we're going to place Let's just place two cards face down in the counter zone. Counters are always placed face down because those are your trap cards, which would be familiar to Yu-Gi-Oh players. This is very familiar to Yu-Gi-Oh Magic players, just so you guys are aware. Now we can go ahead and we see we have Hebaloma T. This is an instant. Uh, this is like a standard spell card in Yu-Gi-Oh where you will activate that. It goes in the instant zone and then the instant cards, once their effect resolves, negates, or once the card effect is done, and it goes straight from the instant zone to the discard zone and it has been used. We can't use this one. The fighter gains 100. The fighter gains 175 life, but it can only be activated once per game per player. We could use this right now and increase our fighter over their maximum health, but not all cards allow you to increase over the maximum health. So let's say, for example, we do that. We activate Hebaloma T. Our fighter gains 175. We would write plus 175 in the life, and then do the addition so we can keep track. Now that that card resolves, it goes to the discard zone, okay? Now, what we have here is Ilvon's Ring. This is an artifact relic type. Now, you have your support zone, and this is a support card. There are multiple types of support cards for support characters and artifacts. Now, artifacts are almost like equip spells or field spells in Yu-Gi-Oh, where this card equips to the fighter whose power is currently 25 or higher, so it has a condition to be met. And if you meet that condition, the equipped fighter cannot be targeted for an attack for the duration of two of your opponent's turns after this card's activation. If your fighter's power falls below 25, negate this card and destroy it. So let's say we will attach that to Alice, so now she can't be targeted for two turns after I end my turn. And now how the turn sequences work in this game, one complete turn must consist of a draw phase and an end phase for that to be counted as a turn. Now turn counting is extremely important because we have action cards. I'm actually going to take a different action card example for you guys so you can see better what I mean. We have Invigorated. Now this is an action physical represented by that symbol and by the text. Now it does attack for, attack for CP plus your face-up ally card's combined strength stats. You gain plus two mind and plus two strength and it has a counter of three. Now essentially what this is gonna do, say we activate Invigorated and that goes horizontally in the action cooldown zone. Once the attack goes through, now the turn counter is three. That is for how many complete turns must pass 
for this card to leave the field. Because once you activate an action card, it stays on the field for the duration of the counter. Now, each one of the numbers that has a, a different interaction based on whether it will return to the deck, which most cards return, most action cards return to the deck once they're used. Some of them go to the discard, some of them you draw a card once it resolves. They have a lot of different interactions, but the main thing is you only have a maximum of three actions per turn. If you have three uh, action cards, you can activate all three in your turn one at a time. Um, but you have to keep in mind that they will remain on the field and negate those zones essentially so you cannot use them for the rest of the turn. And then you're only able to attack with your fighter as a base attack. Now a base attack will take into consideration your fighter's strength or power. You decide which one. Those numbers are usually lower. Alice is 32 and 30 as opposed to the dealing like CP damage is 150. So it's always smart to want to attack with an action card to deal the most amount of damage in the shortest amount of turns. However, if you're unable to, or if you don't have any in your hand, you don't have any zones, or you're being prevented from using an action card, you can always attack with a base attack. So say, I will attack with my strength, so I'm attacking for 32 damage, which is not a lot, but it's still something. Think about it like this is your character doing a basic punch as opposed to a special attack, okay? But you can only activate one base attack or choose to activate action cards. You can not You can activate as many action cards as you want, but as soon as you activate one, you can no longer base attack. As soon as you choose the base attack, you can no longer activate action cards. So it's one or the other. Use this zone or attack with a base attack. That's how that works. So, and that's essentially how attacking works in this game and how you are setting up your field. So let's say if my opponent attacks, I activate create distance during that engagement alone. When your fighter is targeted for a physical attack, because there are two types of attacks, physical and magic, uh, negate the attack and then at the and then end the battle phase so they can no longer attack. During your next turn, you can only attack with magic action cards. The way you want to look at it is as if these two characters are fighting in an anime battle and distance and um, attack type matter based on their proclivities and based on their own abilities. That is the basics for how a game plays out. If you want to see actual gameplay of me and my brother doing a mock battle, then you, I will link that video in the description and at the end. And if you're interested in the card game, it is available on GameCrafter. You can buy the board, you can buy individual decks. I will work on getting booster sets and stuff available in the future. Um, and then, of course, when you purchase a deck, you do get a printed out rule sheet with all the rules, and it's still a work in progress, so if some rules need to be answered, if there are some weird engagements, then I, if those are things I need to figure out by playing. But uh, yeah, that will wrap up the basic for Vengeance Battle Card. If you enjoyed, leave a like, check out the card game over on Game Crafter in the link in the description below, and I will see you all in the next video. Bye-bye.